we do for one thing. A lot of wild electrical and computer science engineering. Is that we didn't have computer science at that time. Uh, we didn't even have those big mainframes to put cards in. Them. <laughs> and, and, and speaking of computers, <laughs> at least a thousand times more computing power here than I had in my hands when I landed on the moon. Think about that. 41 years ago, and, and, and it hadn't stopped. And, uh, you know, today's technology is obsolete tomorrow morning. It's just the way your life is, and it's, it's got to be pretty exciting for you. Uh, I can talk about anything you want. I'll give you a little bit of my background. And, uh, and I do have a PowerPoint. I can show you a few pictures from the moon, take you on a quick trip to the moon if you'd like to. Uh, uh, real quick, I, uh, I graduated born in Asian history, I know. Uh, 1956, and uh, I graduated uh, with an electrical engineering degree, which was uh, my dad, primarily my dad's, which is quite frankly, because at that point in time, I was a, a youngster during World War II. And uh, I saw uh, naval aviators out in the Pacific flying machines to the impossible. And I said, that's where I want to be one day. So that was, that was my focus. And his focus was to kind of be getting the education. Uh, hello there. You made it. Yes. Get, get the down in front here. <laughs> get, I thought you were going to introduce me, brother. I was. You started. Well, get over here. <laughs> <laughs> I started too quick. No, it's okay. Come, come over here and introduce me. I can tell you then I you in electrical and computer engineering. <laughs> and was commissioned a U.S. Navy officer graduate school. In addition to those degrees, Dr. Cernan had additional studies at the Wharton Doctors from Drexel and Gonzaga University and from the Western State College of Law. You come to judge. <laughs> changes and, and the big thing about it is you cannot turn your back on opportunities. You can head out in one direction for five or six years, uh, but but don't plan on doing the same thing for the next 20 or 30 years because you're going to get bored, you're going to be stereotyped, and you're going to miss a lot of great opportunities to do something. After my five years of flying in the Navy, I, I you know, I'm an engineer. I better go out and find out what an engineer does. and. Uh, <laughs> Thought about going with uh, going. I, I love the mountains. Thought about going to Denver, Colorado, and uh, and uh, seeing if I get a job with Martin Marietta, and uh, for 24 hours a day up there. I hope for you it was a piece of cake compared to what they did with us, did uh, to us up there. And that time frame now was uh, was a was uh, 61. I was up there for two and a half years, two years. And I was going to take a third year at, at uh, Princeton, get a little bit more education, because I felt at that time that might be a good thing to do. 1961 in May, literally looking for us, to us, for the, for the United States. What are, you, what are you going to do about it? What are you? Because, you, you know, this is important to us. We can't let this communist nation control space. And uh, we were working on it, and uh, in a slow, progressive way. And, and three weeks after Alan Shepard flew, I, I'm three weeks after Alan Shepard flew, which was three weeks after you Gagarin flew. Shepard flew the first week in May of '61. Three weeks later, the President of the United States, John F. Kennedy, said, "Okay, folks, I guess we're smart enough. We're going to go to the moon. Challenge this country to do it." Most people uh, thought it was impossible. And again, I was I was 27 year old young. It was requiring uh, 
1,500 hours of jet time. I didn't have that. I had about 13. I had a good career, a lot of carrier landings. Required test pilot school. Hadn't been in the Navy long enough to go to test pilot school. If I was going to stay in the Navy, that was certainly on my agenda, hopefully. And I said I'd love to. But by the time I get good enough to fly in space, by the time I get good enough to be called one of those guys, and I, there won't be anything left to do. All the pioneering will be over. And I went postgraduate school, and in, in a little over two years, no, I didn't meet NASA's qualifications, and yet the Navy was Navy was going to recommend me to meet a NASA. I, I guess based upon some of my past record or whatever. The, the bottom line to all that is I eventually got selected uh, in the selection process. I went down to Houston, Texas, walked into the ballroom at the old Rice Hotel, and there were 400, give or take one or two, of the finest aviators this country could produce. They were all test pilots. There was every speed record, every altitude record, every all kinds of combat experience in that room, of which I had none, and me. 400 of them, literally 400 of them, and, uh, and me, and I, you know, what am I doing here? I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an odd man out. Maybe I'll be able to meet an astronaut or something before it's all over. Uh, and again, I tell you that because I don't, don't ever count yourself out. My dad always used to say, well, you know, wh whatever you confront, whatever you do, classroom, playing field, wherever it is, wherever it is just go out and do your best. You're not going to be better than everyone at everything. He was right about that. But he said, someday you're going to surprise yourself. And he was right about that, too. If there's one reason uh, I was able to literally get where I got in, in my fairy tale life, it's because I never forgot that. But he also added uh, the fact that there's only one person who knows what their best really is. And, you know, we can all take a lot of shortcuts, thinking we'll get there faster. But, you know, there's no free lunches. You know, you got to pay your dues. You want to do it right the first time. And, uh, and so that's just a little my philosophy. That's a little bit about what literally got me to the moon. So 10 years after I graduated, left this university, uh, as I said, where without knowing it, I was taking those first steps into space. I, uh, I was the second American, the third person in history to walk in space. And the f first was a Russian, he was out for 10 minutes. The second was, was American, Ed White. He was out for 20 minutes. <coughs> and my job was to fly a backpack, be out for three and a half, three hours and fly a backpack around the world. And I, you know, as smart as we were, we had the finest engineers in the world. And when I flew that flight, I call it my book, Space, uh, Space Walk from Hell, because that's what it turned out to be. Think about this. We went out there into zero gravity with a couple handlebars to hold on to, and I'm going to turn valves on this backpack and, and press down and push the levers down. And someone forgot to remind us all of Newton's laws for a reaction. <laughs> opposite, opposite reaction. I turn a valve, it would turn me. I, I, I telescope a hand, an arm. Off I'd go. And it, it, I got all fogged up um, out there daytime, nighttime, long story, but uh, we, I didn't get the job done in one sense, in retrospect, because I discovered what we didn't know. And that's what a lot of our space flights were, not only to learn what, to, to, to understand what we did know, because, but to, un to understand and uncover and discover those things we didn't think of, because there was something like that on each and every flight. That's, that's, that's engineering. That's the technology of it all. And uh, uh, went down to 40,000 feet in a lunar lander, Snoopy, Snoopy and Charlie Brown or our spacecraft. Uh, I tell Neil Armstrong all the time, or I told him all the time, 
Someone had to paint that white line in the sky so he wouldn't get lost. All he had to do was cover the last 47,000 feet, <laughs> and he did it pretty well. But each and every flight had something new come up that we didn't expect. Uh, but that's the way the program went. That's the way engineering goes. That's, that's, that's the way we got where we did. And let me add this at this point in time. Everyone who went to the moon, including Apollo 13, which was touch and go for a while, has come home to talk about it. That is a testimonial to American engineering, ingenuity, and commitment. And that's something to think about. Each and every person who put a nut and bolt, who designed a system, who whatever it was, assembled, tested the spacecraft we flew, uh, took ownership of that spacecraft. That was theirs. And the part that they played in it was not going to fail. What they turned over to us was the finest piece of hardware by the finest group of people in the world, and it was up to us to do the rest of the job. And that's where we had to come in and have the confidence that we knew, we knew what we had and that, that we were capable of doing what needed to be done. And went back to the moon on Apollo 17. Uh, there's a lot in between. Apollo 10 and Apollo 17 from a personal point of view. But anyway, I ended up commanding Apollo 17. The last three flights had a lunar rover. Drove around, drove around the, not the sky, drove around the, uh, the moon. We landed in a valley that had mountains on three sides higher than the Grand Canyon is deep. Think about that. And, and in the north, northeastern corner of the moon, edge of the moon, and so the sky, the earth was always in the southwestern sky. And, you know, if you ever want to, you know, start looking up orbital, orbital mechanics and the, 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 the physics of Earth, Moon, Sun, rotation and revolution and all that, you'll, you'll understand why. That's the way it is. It never moved. The Earth, whole time we're on the moon, 75 hours. Now, the phase of the Earth changed. Because when we went, it was a full, near a full Earth, and the moon was near a, just a sliver because we wanted to land, and, and we landed in the very eastern, northeastern edge of the moon, but we wanted to land with a, uh, an early morning sun to give us the shadows, to give us some depth, protect, depth perception, because no matter, no matter how much hardware, we had landing radar, we had a com state vector computer that thought it knew where we were, but it, you know what it comes down to? It comes down to this. When you start looking out the window, and realizing where you are, and you start picking up landing sites, the computer doesn't. And I was talking, we were talking to some folks out there a minute ago. Uh, you, you are living in the digital age. You are living in a world of, of computers. And one problem that your, your, your predecessors have already faced, at least those in the aviation industry, and I think it can spread elsewhere, is they're beginning to use technology as a crutch and not a I mean, they, could, they had few instruments to tell them where they were around the world, but they couldn't do anything. And we built, we built the human intelligence into our systems from day one. Now, we had autopilots. We could do a lot of things with what we had on board. But, you know, it went back to the point that if you don't like what's going on, you've got the ability to take it over and fly. The big Saturn V, I don't you know, the shuttle was big. Saturn V would blow you away. Now, your world is a shuttle world. Saturn V was 5.6 million pounds of thrust. It stood almost 400 feet high. And let me tell you, that was one heck of a machine. I flew it once in a day, and I was the only guy to fly it at night. And I almost, I almost dared the guidance system. That's the only thing that was automatic on our flights, the, the takeoff, the, the liftoff, that, that put us into Earth orbit before we headed out to the moon. I had, I had trained so much and so many times for failures, I dared it. I dared it. I, almost, I wanted it to fail. I didn't. I didn't want it to fail. But I did want it to fail. Does that make sense? I wanted, I wanted to prove, I wanted to prove to myself that I could, I could fly that thing into orbit. So don't let, don't let technology govern your life. Don't let technology govern your way of thinking. Use the technology that surrounds you, that you're confronted with every day of your life to create new opportunities, to create new things, to, to, 
to make our life a little bit more, you know, pleasant. Like I said, today's technology is obsolete tomorrow morning. You know, I thought when we got when we got uh, uh, satellites up there that uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the American Eagle is looking the modern America today's American Eagle is looking at the future, doing two other things. Its wing just touches the moon. It said we're going to take what we have learned from going. Should, that's been our goal for over 200 years. I think. You know, unfortunately, in space, in the last five years, uh, it told me you know, it was like the universe lit up from the moon. It was like a thousand suns, and I've seen some other pictures, and it really is pretty impressive. I was way up on top. This is that same night. But it was a time-lapse picture taken from Orlando as we went in the sky. We went first in, a, in the Earth orbit, checked out the systems, and then we again launched, uh, fired the third stage of the rocket, pushed 20, 15 minutes. Uh, you fly through, what, 16 sunrises and sunsets at a 24-hour period. They're gorgeous. They're magnificent. It's a place to go if you get a chance. <laughs> but you don't, you don't see the Earth. You see the horizon, but you don't see the moon. We headed out to the moon. This is, this is how the Earth emerged in our window. It somehow closed in around itself from that, that curved horizon. And you were beginning to see, in the course of a few short hours, a very familiar, but a very strange sound. Because you no longer were flying over cities and coastlines and hometowns. Uh, you are now beginning to see the entirety of the world. Magnificent blues of the oceans and, 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 and whites of the snow and the clouds. You could look from one continent, if, well, let's go to the before you do that. Oh, up. sorry. Back up. Yeah, okay. This part was a very interesting place. And so I expect that picture may have been about 30, 40,000 miles out as we headed towards the moon. Interesting. Go ahead. The interesting thing. <coughs> the moon's over here. And you're headed back. And Mission Control when it tracked our, you know, when we fired the engine again and they tracked this, they said, you're right on, you're right on track. You're going to miss the moon by 50 miles, which meant we wanted to go in front of it by 50 miles. Go behind it, you're going to end up in, in the sun. You're going to miss the moon by 50 miles. And I kept thinking, we couldn't even see the moon. So produce it. And all I said was, I hope so. <laughs> uh, you know, and that's another thing. When you get close, you just, you, I'll tell you one I get. Okay, this is, this is that same picture 12 hours later. Every, no, 24 hours is turning. And there's Baja California, North America. You can see the bottom of South America over them, you know, about 5 o'clock. Uh, it's wintertime up there at the North Pole. What's interesting about this and what gets your attention is that blackness that surrounds the Earth. It's very much unlike a multicolored picture that you may have seen on a black background. And through that blackness, but there's nothing for it to shine on. Is it infinity? I don't know how to define infinity. I call it the endlessness of space and the endlessness of time. And it doesn't, doesn't show what I want to say here in this picture, but this Earth rotates through that blackness with unbelievable preciseness and logic and purpose. You come to a conclusion, and I challenge this on my second trip to the moon, it's just too beautiful to have happened by accident. And you see it three-dimensionally. It's like you could reach your hand out and, and, and stick it behind. And when you look at the moon, even from here, think of it three-dimensionally. Think of it out there in space, but not at the end of space, wherever that is. And that's what this was like. It was, and this is when you have to pinch yourself and, and say, do I really know where I am at this moment in space and time? Uh, you're no longer, there's two different space programs, one in Earth orbit and one when you go somewhere. And in our case, it was the moon. They're, they're different both technologically because of what they require. Uh, they're different philosophically, and they're truly different spiritually. I didn't say religiously, I said spiritually, because we're human beings, we're not robots, and this has got to affect 
every human being who would have the opportunity to see there. And even better than that, stand on the moon and look back at this earth, which becomes so small as you head out to the moon that you can cover it with your thumb. Your identity with reality you can cover with nothing bigger than the palm of your hand. And it's, it's dynamic because it's rotating. On that axis you can't see, there's no strings holding it up. It's, it's alive, it's, 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 it's incredible. Next, this, is, this was our, our goal. Uh, we didn't see this until literally we got there. We, when we got, this is a picture taken on our way out. When we got there, and we're in daylight all the time, the paradox is, as I said, you're in daylight surrounded by the blackest black you can possibly conceive in your mind, three-dimensional blackness. Uh, and because there's nothing for the sun to shine on. Sun is shining. If you stuck your hand out, the sun's shining on it. If you don't, just don't stick your hand out, but not at 25,000 miles an hour. Uh, you, uh, uh, there's nothing for it to shine on. Uh, you know, it, it, that's one of those crazy paradoxes. Time on the moon is another one. That's another story. And if we go to Mars, when we go to Mars, it'll change again. But when you get close to the moon, you know, and you know you're supposed to be close about two and a half, three days later. Uh, you, you feel its presence. You're still in sunlight. You're still heading out there. You still can't see it. But you can feel its presence. Suddenly you go into the shadow of the moon itself. You are now in the shadow of the moon. And that's a big change because for two and a half days you've been in sunlight. Now, wow, it's dark. That's darkness. You're still surrounded by blackness, but that shadow puts you in darkness. And we came out of that darkness, and then came out of the darkness, and still didn't see the moon, and we went out about 10,000 miles beyond it and came back in and made a nosedive for that 50-mile target we had above the surface of the moon. And just before we got there, the, the back side, you know, there's not a, you guys are all smart enough, there's not a dark side of the moon. There's a front side and a back side, and it's a ball. And when the sun shines on it, 50% of that ball is lit up. So if you look at this, if you're on the back side, it's pretty dark. If this was a half moon, half of the front side would be lit, and half of the back side would be lit. So many people use, you guys are produced, these pickup trucks. We, we had everything strapped to it, the lunar rover, all of our instrumentation. It, and how could that thing fly in space? Well, it didn't have to endure any aerodynamic forces. It was, it was inside a shroud uh, under that, uh, on the third stage of that booster. And when we were on our way, we we're in a vacuum, no air. We went around and retrieved this out of the booster and let the booster go on. And so we were nose to nose with this thing. And it, there's two sections, a descent stage. We're upside down now. And there's a descent engine and the pads we landed on in a ascent stage, uh, which you know was just a great little flying machine. Go ahead, I want to make sure we got some time. That's the valley we landed in. Uh, mountains on three sides, as I said, higher the Grand Canyon is deep. There's a little landslide up there. We landed shore of that landslide, and uh, pretty nice place to be. That was home for me for three days. Go ahead. That's the first thing we did on the moon. <laughs> And we did it as a way primarily of saying thank you. We didn't claim that piece of real estate as, as part of the United States. It was saying, you know, a lot of people, half a million, 500,000 people helped get us there. We didn't get there alone. And this was a way of just saying thank you. And that particular flag uh, flew in mission control when Apollo 11 landed on the moon. And so what we did in, in, in making sort of a little historical, you know, thing is take that flag off the wall at Mission Control in Houston, took it with us, and now it stands on the surface of the moon and brought another one back. Why are there wrinkles if there's no wind, no air? I get that question all the time, <laughs> you know, especially by people who say we didn't go. <laughs> it, 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 it's an nylon flag, and it was just rolled and wrapped up and crinkled so that we could store it. And it was on a telescoping rod, that, that horizontal rod on top, 
you know, you could bend it down. You bend it down and wrap the flag around it. And when we lifted up the rod, it latched in place. And the flag came out wrinkled. Nobody thought about that. Nobody predicted it. No one had planned it that way. It's just the way it came out. Uh, next one. There's a rover. See, there's the uh, the wire wheels. It's a rover, what we call a stripped-down rover. We had to unpack it. Wheels were folded in, body folded in. I'm going a little fast here. And uh, that was sort of a test run, and then it, we put all kinds of electronic gear on it and, and, and uh, geology gear and what have you. Great flying machine, great, uh, not flying machine. It almost did <laughs> half the time. In one six gravity, uh, you were three wheels on the ground all the time. One six gravity, only 12 human beings in the world have experienced one sixth. Zero gravity, you've seen all this fancy stuff flying around somersaults. It's for the pits. You can't put you can't put water in a cup. You you can't lay a pencil down. It just floats away. One six gravity has got all the advantages of zero gravity because you only weigh one sixth as much. Theoretically, you can jump six times as high and far, but with the suit, you, you're somewhat restricted. But there's a down. You can you can drink out of a cup. You can lay something down. It's going to be there. And and I can't tell you how important some of those normal at-home living conditions are when you go someplace like the moon. Next. <laughs> this is just goes you see how we penetrated the lunar surface and footprints or whatever, uh, covered with a, a film of lunar dust that came from volcanic activity and meteor impacts and being no, no only one-six gravity and no air resistance on the moon. This stuff would fly for hundreds of miles away. Covered almost everything. There were outcrops in many places, but it, most of it was covered by dust. Uh, next. And this just gives you an idea, you know, where we live. We landed uh, in this valley. Uh, a lot of craters you don't see. Uh, it, you know, you have to pick and choose where you're going to spend your, you know, land that thing because it had a 15 degree design limit. That doesn't mean at 16 degrees you were going to tip over when you landed because there were marshes and everything, but you tried to keep it less than 15 degrees. When, and you can see we're leaning over a little bit on that one. Yeah, next. This, was, this boulder is about three stories high, and, and I had to reach up. There's a sample taken. I had to reach up. Uh, that's my partner, but I had to reach up and grab a sample from way above my head and bring it home. Alan Bean, who flew to the moon on Apollo 12, has become, I think, the Remington of the space age. He's, he's an artist. He's good at it. He's a naval aviator, but he decided he always loved to paint, and he painted that picture, and he said, Gene, what, tell me about it. What were you thinking about it? And his daughter and my daughter went to school together. They were neighbors. They played together. I said, Alan, if I knew you were going to make that picture so famous, I would have put Tracy, that's my daughter's Tracy's initials in it, uh, in that place. He said, how would you do it? I wrote TDC, Tracy Dawn Cernan. He went back home, painted out those handprints. He was very detailed in everything he did. He put TDC, called it Tracy's Rock. It was a, it was a fold-out page of Southwest Art, and they sold it for a million dollars, I think. I, yeah. With no royalties. <laughs> yes. That picture I like. That, that's, that's, you know, you talk about magnificent desolation. I think that's it. That's a lamp. That's home. I don't know how far away this is. It looks like those pictures were blended together. They were not. That's the lunar landscape. That's how the, the soil is basically all all gray in color, but shades of color, and that's a piece of a landslide that came down. Around. Now you can see all the junk we had to put on the rover. It, it was just the antennas, electronic gear. We, we, we were outfitted pretty well. We drove, covered about 36 kilometers in the three days we were there. Doesn't sound like a lot, but we spent a lot of time out, off this rover doing a lot of uh, exploration, if you will. And next, because I want, I want to take that's, <laughs> you know, I was the only way, and I knocked a fender off. <laughs> no roadside assistance. And we took a whole slew of geology maps. As a matter of fact, I just contributed a, a whole book full of those that went with us outside the spacecraft on the moon uh, that we used to cover our whole landing site. These were four of those that were going to be probably less useful. And so the only way we could solve the problem, the reason we had to solve a problem, the dust would come over the top, just like a, a, a bicycle on a rainy day without a, 
without a, 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 a fender. And a dust was, it's like graphite, but graphite's a lubricating material. This was just the opposite. It, it, it got in our suits again. And when we, inside a spacecraft, we looked at some of the rocks that got in our fingers, it penetrated everything. It could penetrate a sealed bearing, and we had to keep it off our electronic gear. So there's something, don't ever leave home without it. We took duct tape, duct tape to the moon. <laughs> that is duct tape. We taped those four masts together, used two clamps uh, from uh, uh, inside the spacecraft to, to hold lights and, and clamp that thing on, and it worked perfectly. And that particular fender sits in the Smithsonian right now. We brought it home. <laughs> so it's, it's got some history to it. Next. And that's just a picture taken from the, uh, the window. You can see how we messed up the surface. We put all kinds of scientific experiments up there. We put, we put seismic experiments. We had, and they, we put a, a, a control, big control box out there and ran for 10 years. With, we, we, I fueled a nuclear power plant. It was that big. Took it up there, fueled it, carried it with us, worked for over 10 years, and I finally shut it down because the budget didn't allow them to continue to collect all that data. But uh, those are little rocket engines we use to control our attitude, pitch roll and yaw. Uh, that flag, someone said, how long will it be there? And I said, forever, however long forever is. Uh, there's nothing, nothing's gonna change. I did put my daughter's initial up there just before I left where I parked the lunar rover. And someone said, how long will they be there? Who knows? Forever. Uh, it's a very, there's so many paradoxes up there. Uh, so, and that was one of the last pictures we took. I tried to get, I tried to get country and man and, and home in the earth. And I had to take a camera and bend it down and hold it between my legs. And I took a series of pictures to get this one. And that's, that came out. And uh, I, I just, you got another one there? That's uh, look like a coal miner. That's probably the last night, the third night, after we got in the spacecraft after three days of working on the moon. And, and uh, look at the suit. That's all that dust that penetrates into that suit. That's a lunar module. A lunar module was not any bigger than that. Not including me, just that. For two guys, and when we took off our suits for comfort and had to dry our suits out, there's like four people in there. It, it, it was not small, it was, and, and the food was not very good. There was no hot coffee, among other things. <laughs> uh, go ahead, next one. And this is our liftoff. I set the lunar module. The only thing that was controlled, other than the guidance system and the, and the booster, uh, either automatically or, or from the ground, was the television camera. We didn't want to have to mess with it. so. Wherever we went, wherever we parked the rover, they had the te television camera following us because we didn't have time to play with it. And so uh, I parked the lunar rover about three quarters of a mile behind the lunar module, and they had the television camera controlled from the ground, and uh, they timed it perfectly and caught our liftoff. And what happens is explosive bolts blow all the, all the Explosive bolts, they just blow and you're separated and the acid engine fires. This is all timed pretty, pretty closely. And, uh, and, and we, we had a computer. That I set the computer up. It counted to zero. It fired. But I had a manual button. There's a lot of redundancy in there. And they tell me I beat the computer by some nanosecond or something. I don't know. I was pretty anxious to get home at that point in time. <laughs>